Welcome everyone. Um, in this lecture, we'll uh, pick up again um, aspects of radio, but we'll concentrate on Wi-Fi firstly, but also on Bluetooth and then um, intensive applications. Um, the main applications we're talking about is contact tracing. So um, you've seen this slide before. We have a variety of radio sensors in our devices, wearable and mobile devices. In the previous lecture, we have talked a lot about um, location and global position system as well as cellular. Um, in this lecture, we will we'll concentrate more on Bluetooth, Wi-Fi and RFID. In terms of Wi-Fi, um, this is a radio that is also called 802.11, and that's the standard for communication in what is called local area network. It has two modes. The most common mode is a client server, and in a lecture theater, uh, for example, or in a building, there are a few base stations around so that your devices, which have a Wi-Fi receiver, would be able to contact the server the base stations um, in the same way, roughly, protocol is slightly different um, than you would do with a cellular uh, base station. However, the less known approach is a peer-to-peer -peer mode where Wi-Fi devices might be able to communicate um, independently of other devices and base station with the same kind of right, not in a client server mode, but with the same kind of um, higher, the same level of hierarchy. Um, the speed of this network, Wi-Fi network, vary greatly, uh, but it's generally quite high. Um, and uh, in terms of communication, this is done in various ways using some forms of multiplexing, uh, mainly spatial, using the base station and the area over the space of a certain Wi-Fi base station to allow communication with the clients with the base station, um, which is then slotted over time as well. So there's time and space multiplexing. There's some coding of frequency hopping as well in some cases. Um, in terms of peer-to-peer -peer models, one example of um, how uh, the devices might be able to communicate in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion with each other um, is described by something that you might have seen in a networking class. So the MAC layer level is an approach called carrier sensing multiple access uh, with collision avoidance. And um, here is a little picture um, where you can see that a, de a device deciding if they want to communicate would uh, not be instructed by a server, because in this case, in peer to -peer model, there is no server. And you would wait for a certain amount of time, forget the acronyms, just uh, consider this is a waiting time. If when it decides to send the message out in its, um, in its medium, it would find the medium busy, then you would uh, wait again, sorry. And um, next time it waits, you would then wait a little bit longer, um, an additional contention window time to get a slot, for example, after four slots here. And, and be able, well, in this case, in this graph, we'll wait six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 15, 12 slots uh, of this random back of mechanism. This is done to avoid collision because if everyone um, found the medium busy at this time and then waiting, the same amount of time before sending, they would all collide again with some randomness added here, then the collisions um, are avoided somehow. So at some point, one of them would be able to transmit the frame while the others are not transmitting and that frame will be received by a receiver antenna somehow. You'd be surprised of the technology that is already around using this ad hoc level connectivity. And one of them is perhaps in your pocket. AirDrop, in fact, uses uh, Wi-Fi peer-to-peer um, connectivity to send um, at higher speed. One would think that you would use BLE, but actually it turns out to use the Wi-Fi radio for this in peer-to-peer -peer mode. <clears throat> and why would you do that? Well, because usually in AirDrop, you try to send quite big files and, um, and yeah, well, Wi-Fi allows you to do that. And it, it's quite fast, faster than uh, Bluetooth. But let's talk a bit more about Bluetooth. Um, Bluetooth is another radio that um, is contained in most of the existing devices. It has low connectivity range, meaning that you can only uh, speak to devices that are quite close to you. It has also low energy consumption, is on a bandwidth that um, is greatly affected by obstacles. Um, and so, um, yeah, 
<laughs> not only it has a lower range, but if there's something in between, you wouldn't be able to transmit very well. Um, that turns out to be a good thing for some applications such as contact tracing that we'll talk about later. Transmission rate is lower um, than the one we generally see for Wi-Fi. Um, and this needs to be remembered if you're trying to send something big, it'll take longer. Um, there are various advertising channels, uh, but various advertising channels, uh, various channels um, that are, can be used for communication. Um, it has been integrated to what we call central and peripheral devices, where peripheral devices are really dumb devices. Uh, phones are already considered central devices, which can do scanning, while peripheral devices cannot do scanning. They just send packets of advertising. In general, a Bluetooth um, state um, is either uh, scanning, advertising, standby, initiating, and connection. Uh, this is for central devices, which can scan, but peripheral devices such as your mouse can only advertise. And uh, we'll see in one slide um, how the advertising and scanning works. So in general, advertising happens at set intervals. Um, these advertising channels are selective not to interfere with other uh, very common networks such as Wi-Fi, which are on the same, could be on the same frequency. Scan and make sure that they're listening regularly and they are on certain advertising channels and then collect the advertisement. And, and when the advertisements arrive, then you can establish connectivity. So the latency of the advertisement and scanning is determined uh, or by this, this measure. So here you have on the timeline, you have a device scanning at regular frequency. So these blue things are the four scanning um, interval. So I stay awake from here to here. I'm scanning, I'm hearing, I'm prepared to hear if there is an advertisement. In this case, the advertisement, which is quite small, arrives just before this, so it won't be received. Um, here is another irregular advertisement that is quite small and again won't be received because no one is listening. There's no blue slot here. Same for here. And then finally, here the advertisement is received because it's in this blue window. So the the, the important parameters are uh, between how big would the advertisement be, how 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 large would this transmission be, so that it, it falls, it's likely to fall inside one of this window. And in some protocols, we, we're not talking about them today. The other aspect is um, would the information that is needed for this advertisement to succeed, i.e., uh, information about who is sending this advertisement. And when would the real message be sent, be contained just in the header of the message and repeated constantly or just in the header? Because if it's just in the header, even if this message was longer, it would be lost um, because you haven't heard the important bit of it, although you knew there was an advertising message. And also, how big is the scanning window? How long is the scanning window? How often it happens? These are all characteristics that affect the battery, but also the latency of the communication. So when we're talking in terms of contacts, um, and these contacts are important to, um, if we're, if we're thinking of well-being and socialization, as well as epidemics, and we're seeing contact tracing quite a bit in the context of COVID, um, what is important to digitally detect in terms of contacts? Um, well, that clearly depends on the application, but the technology would allow to detect the duration of a contact, how much two individuals or two devices are co-located, possibly even the distance. We'll discuss distance quite carefully later, but are we really close or are we not close? One other aspect that has been discussed is um, the position. Are we close, but I'm not facing uh, one another? The frequency of contacts, do I meet you often? The angle and position, so am I facing each other? Are we facing away? Are we diagonally? Um, we talked a little bit about angle when uh, we discussed um, infrared technology and uh, I showed you that uh, study that we've done with the angle of contact to understand how people were interacting with each other um, in a, a few slides back, a few lectures back. 
And then the location and the context of the contact is important. Is this contact happening in a restaurant? Is this contact happening at home? Um, is the contact happening outside? Um, and so, so these are things that possibly some of the location or uh, um, a combination of location will be able to give you. The issues with this is um, the interference in the objects impact the signal and often certain frequencies are more impacted than others. Um, certainly Bluetooth, as I said, is very impacted by obstacles. The line of sight um, is in fact uh, another aspect uh, is as wind, um, wind affecting the signal. Some signals are more affected than others. Um, so, so all this um, can be done with various radios. Uh, GPS gives a good indication of um, contacts outdoor. Um, so I think the resolution of less than 10 meters, uh, perhaps, is a good uh, good approximation of what GPS can do. But it doesn't work indoor. Um, Bluetooth has low energy and allows for this um, contact to work, but it's, uh, it's highly affected by obstacle and, uh, and, and it's, um, the distance um, calculation is quite difficult to be achieved appropriately with precision. Wi-Fi is even less precise and more energy consuming in general than Bluetooth. RFID technology are generally low range and require dedicated devices. They usually, you usually need um, readers for active RFIDs. So um, either you have an instrumented environment where these are, or you probably won't be able to do uh, much more than that. Active RFIDs, uh, they try to um, well passive RFIDs need a sorry uh, need a, this, this base station technology. Active RFIDs exist um, have quite low range um, and they are quite this is quite dedicated and some of the existing devices do not contain them. But um, one of the studies we've done was in fact with RFIDs and contact tracing. I will talk about that. So in addition to contact tracing, which we'll be discussing uh, quite widely later. Uh, in the slides. Uh, the first application I would like to concentrate on is the use of space and office analytics. So um, architects, uh, but also social scientists are very interested to understand our behavior in buildings, offices, and the working of teams. Um, there are applications in well-being, stress monitoring group dynamics uh, that can be done with this sort of technology. I only refer to uh, a few studies that we have we have conducted with RFIDs, but also with Bluetooth. Um, the this is a an RFID device that was put on the chest to someone, and it would be able to recognize if it was seeing another RFID device. So you would uh, be able to log face to face contact. This is a Bluetooth device uh, that we uh, manufactured and um, it was uh, able to use the Bluetooth to understand use of space and contacts as well. Um, these graphs are related to the RFID study and they're related to um, the use of space of groups in one building and in another building. Now, the first thing you might notice is the lack of um, grids and um, well, the lack of color in these two areas. So these are groups. So you, you can infer that, so for example, on the X and Y axis, you have the participants, the number of people we have tagged. And so uh, if you have um, a very black dot here, it means that this participant was quite a lot in contact with this participant here. And so the lack of it means no contact. And these are ordered by groups. So there's a lot of inter group interaction, but not very much outer group interaction, intra group, intra group, inter, inter group interaction was less. Well, here in the second building, when the groups moved, there is quite a bit of both. So already this is an indication given by digital data of uh, the change of activity uh, and pattern of contact of the various people in the building. This is also demonstrated by uh, looking at how groups were working through floors. In the old building, um, group A and C were on the same floor. And this is gray here because they were on the same floor. There was a lot of interaction, both in food area, meeting area, and offices. 
while in the other um, group, group B and C didn't meet much and group A and B didn't meet much. Now immediately, if you go to the new building, you see that the three bars are all high. And this is happened when A and B moved on the same floor. So before it was A and C being on the same floor and then A and B were on the same floor. So clearly A and B were meeting more because they ended up just meeting near the offices area, near the food places, um, perhaps the meeting area that perhaps didn't change as much, but actually it did increase a bit, maybe some serendipitous interactions, some meetings were organized just because um, you know, people have started talking more. But as a consequence of A and B being on the same floor, um, well, A and C were already meeting a lot and they kept meeting because probably they had a lot of um, work uh, to do together and they kept doing that. But as a result of A and B being on the same floor, also B and C started meeting more because people maybe from group um, C were starting to go on the other floor to meet the group B people, the, sorry, um, the group A people, and then they would meet also the other people. So the result of this study is, is, is probably not as relevant as the, the kind of information that this sort of data can deliver. The second example I would like to talk about today is uh, digital contact tracing. I, I am sure that over the last three years, you've heard this word many times, and many of you probably have already looked at the protocols used for this. So what is digital contact tracing? It's the ability to trace human interactions um, of a person in the context of a disease. Um, in this case of the pandemic, if I am infected, I want to be able to retrace back the people I've met. Uh, well, where meeting means a, a reasonable meeting has happened between us that could lead to an infection. What are the issues related to this? Well, some that would affect the digital aspect of it is what distance should I use when I consider the contact tracing? And, and the position is another aspect that I've probably never been looked at very carefully. Um, how long should the people be in contact for? These are all parameters of the model that would need to be figured out. They would need to be um, thought of by epidemiologists. Um, this particular disease or perhaps this variant of the disease is affected. Um, you know, can, someone can be infected only if the people are together for X amount of time, probabilistically, right? Um, but yeah, are they facing each other? Are they indoor or is it a meeting outdoor? That can also affect the, the, the infection. Not all this has been worked out in, in the last three years, but we've made strides in trying to find the best model for it. In a, in a way, the pandemic has pushed this research map forward. Now, here at the bottom, you see another formula that you might be able to uh, kind of uh, recognize as uh, similar to one we've seen in the lecture of location. And epidemiologists have prepared various models for various types of epidemics. The most basic one, which is even simpler than the one we have seen in the location lecture, is an, a model where you have people that are susceptible, they are then get infected, and notice the previous model was exposed and infected, so they have an additional state over there, and then they go and get susceptible again. So immediately they are able to get the disease again. This is probably not what COVID is. COVID is probably more like a susceptible or even exposed, like in the previous model, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered, or susceptible, directly infected and immediately infected and recovered. Um, so parameters of digital contact traces need to emulate the disease infectivity. So if you look at SIR model, and, and just so that you kind of are exposed to another of this model, um, the way in which we say how many susceptible you will have at the next interval t is dependent um, on this beta that we've seen also in the location model, which is the effective contact rate. So um, how likely is for someone to be um, affected of the number, if you have a number of infected and a number of susceptible, this is the rate of infectivity that um, can make this happen. So uh, depending on how many infected and how many successful you have, if the infectivity is a certain amount, then the number of susceptible becoming infected will be higher than if you, your beta is lower. Similarly, 
the number of infected will be the same number minus the one that were infected before and then, then they recovered. Now, how many will recover depends on a rate that we define here. So that perhaps per unit window, you would have that uh, you recover with a certain speed and that will affect this number. And the number of recovered is again, just this parameter here. I want to say more about these models, but if you are interested, there's uh, there are books and theories, and I can email you um, some of them if you are interested in reading more. They're very fascinating. But this sort of model in in impact um, the the kind of parameters that we need to get from the digital traces. For example, um, how many people are you meeting is um, something that we need to know. But also there are model that there are parameters that depend on the specific disease, for example, the affected contact rate, um, which really is specific to the disease itself. Um, there's one good paper you might want to uh, read that is based, it is trying to model COVID, model um, the infectivity of COVID. And um, uh, really, this is just uh, an indication of the kind of uh, processes uh, that the digital contact traces would need to have to build a good model and to protect people. And so in this case, on day one, you can imagine you have a subject that um, is at home and then goes on a train and then goes to work and then goes to home again. At some point, he realizes that he has symptoms, does a test, is positive, and immediately you would imagine that if you had this information, you'd be able to inform all the people that he has met that were relevant, perhaps not H and I, because they weren't working closely with them. And then they would be able to then isolate. So we need contact logging, contact matching, and then notification. So a digital system should be able to do this phase. Now, for digital contact tracing to happen, um, we need to look at the properties of Bluetooth and how to, to decide what distance would we consider um, for, for, a, uh, for a contact to be. Now, Bluetooth really doesn't have distance, only has a receivable signal strength indicator, meaning that my phone will send a signal, your phone will receive it, and we'll have an indication of a signal strength. And by considering the signal strength with the case with distance, the studies say, and you see the graph there, the signal strength really is dependent on the distance of the user uh, from, the, from, from the, the sender to the receiver and the case quite quickly generally. Um, then based on that, we can decide to put a, associate an RSSI to a distance. I won't talk about all the studies that have been done trying to associate RSSI to distance, but um, this is a very studied area. This notice unfortunately depends a lot on walls, metal, obstacles, water um, in between. So um, getting the right threshold here um, might be very important and can lead to lots of um, lots of false positive or even um, you know mistakes that might not be. Uh, that's been um, made. So there are two ways of doing it. Once you have decided that you have a good distance calculation and you want to um, inform everyone that had this RSSI distance less than X. Well, you can, um, your phone, when you decide, when, when you realize you are infected, uh, if you have a good digital contact tracing log, let's say based on Bluetooth, would have recorded all your contacts from previous days. Your phone would have seen other people and realized which ones were closer to you, were close to you uh, for less than two meters, you know, based on this RSSI model. And so one way would be, I realize I'm infected, my phone sends immediately all my contacts to the server. The contacts get this information, does the matching, and sends a notification to the affected individual. Now, what's the drawback of this? Well, um, there's a central server out there that would know my identity, would know 
all this contact identity, you will know that we would have been together and then has all this, builds a lot of social information about us. Is there an alternative? Well, there is an alternative. Um, even if we consider always the central server to do the matching, the clients um, do not have to use their ID. They can use some sort of secret mechanism to, to give an ID to the server, which then is trans can be sent to the um, various individuals who can then do that translation and understand if they were in contact with someone affected. I have the slide coming up next that describes how this is done. Um, so these tokens, this ephemeral identifier are uploaded to a server. So there's still a central server who does the matching and says, whom um, should I do this? Um, and this information is sent to the client and um, and then this this um, list of infected tokens is, is, is sent around for individuals to see if they match it. More precisely, um, I will explain uh, one of this protocol in particular, but this, this is the general idea. This is uh, DP3T. It's a decentralized privacy preserving protocol that was adopted by Google and Apple for their exposed notification project. It's a decentralized protocol that uses the ID. This if ID are 16 bytes, they are, um, let's say, the the, they are never transmitted to the server. What is transmitted to the server by the infected individual is a secret token, is a secret uh, key that is changed daily. There's two phases in this protocol. One is the tracking phase, and the other one is the reporting phase. So um, in the tracking, the same process happens. Users uh, advertise and scan to send and receive IDs on that day. These IDs, as I said, are linked to individuals uh, by a secret key. The receivers, so every one of them really, logs the FID and the time strength, and obviously the distance signal strength, which is used to consider if they, they could be a contact or not, of everyone they see. But they don't know who these are. They log this ID only, and this, this ID is essentially changed daily. The central authority, uh, when some, some of these devices is uh, confirmed as positive, it confirmed an infection, the client submits the report and uploads a secret key. The secret key of the day of the infection, meaning that from that secret key, an FID can be generated. But neither the server or the other receiver know anything more about the client. All they know is that they have a way to generate an FID. And so what they do is they, everyone can generate the FID and then look for matches in their log. So the, net, the server never see the contact, um, but the, the, the users can realize if they've seen someone infected, even if they don't know who that person is. Now, there are big advantages of this um, in terms of privacy because neither the server, no, the other clients, no, who the, these people are. There are, however, um, trade-offs. I'll, I'll talk first about the second point. In terms of epidemiological modeling, so we've seen all these models that try, we, we saw one based on location, but you can imagine that um, you could try to find those parameters of an epidemiological SIR model by using uh, data of uh, how people meet, how many people have met who, uh, which people have met who and where. And so this epidemiological model thrive when you can have this data about meetings um, and you know who meets who. If this chain of who meets who um, is, is, is lost because the privacy information, you know, the server knows nothing about who is what and who has met what at this point, then um, epidemiological modeling cannot happen um, you know, you're not, you don't have this context on the server. You cannot do this large scale public health modeling. So that, that's a big drawback. Um, at the cost of user privacy, um, you, you would be able to do pretty much, but 
you know, privacy is very important. So the trade-offs here are very interesting to be discussed. Maybe there are other ways in which both can be achieved. False positive. Um, digital solution, because of this RSS correspondence to distance, um, there are lots of parameters that um, need to be set. And as I said, uh, especially Bluetooth is affected by obstacles, is affected by movement, uh, is affected by lots of things and uh, users position, the position of the device with respect to the user itself. Um, the conditions of the room, we know if, it, now we know that in particular in case of COVID, if a room is uh, very badly aired, um, then the infection rate might be higher than when it's uh, the air is filtered very well. So um, it is very difficult to calibrate the parameters of any model or even any contact um, logging that we do. Uh, but this is uh, all an area of very interesting uh, research. And I hope if you want to read more about this, uh, it's a very interesting um, overlap between digital sensing and epidemiological uh, modeling and public health. And so um, with this, I will um, see you next time.